for your patience. Um, happy to see you all here. Today's a really packed house, which is great. This is the kind of colloquium we really want to see, and we really want you to, again, bring your questions and, and curiosity to the table. I'm really delighted to have Dr. Reza Bakari here with us today. He currently serves on the board of directors of Amnesty International and is also the Vice President for Continuing Education, Workforce Development, and Strategic Community Partnerships and Professional International Politics at City University of New York, Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn. He has a long-standing, passionate commitment to promoting human rights globally. This interest began in his years as a dissident in Iran, where he was arrested under the Shah's regime for possessing testimonies of political prisoners and banned books. Since becoming a higher ed practitioner in the US, he has intensified this devotion by conceiving and successfully implementing <coughs> civic and global engagement programs at colleges, lecturing and writing about the imperative of global citizenship, and serving on the board of national organizations devoted to human, civil, and democratic rights. Reza established an Amnesty International chapter at LaGuardia Community College in New York in 2000, uh, and also served on the board of Student World Assembly since 2004 and is chairman from 2008. Uh, Reza serves on a number of different committees, including the National Steering Committee of Democracy, Com of Democracy Commitment as Secretary of the Board of Global Citizenship Alliance and on the Advisory Council of the Aspen Institute's Y Seminar. Uh, he has trained a number of national executive leadership workshops and brings extensive experience in shared governance, grants development, fundraising, strategic planning, assessment, resources, and much more. Reza received the Distinguished College Administrator Award from Phi Theta Kappa International Honor Society in 2013. He has taught at Fordham University, Vassar College, International Pacific College in New Zealand, and has been a visiting faculty at the Salzburg Global Seminar in Salzburg, Australia. He frequently speaks and writes about the imperative of global, intercultural, and interreligious understanding in our rapidly globalizing and highly interdependent world. His recent article on Educating for Religious Pluralism and Inclusive Citizenship appeared in Summer 2015, Diversity and Democracy. Dr. Fakari, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Michael. She, she forgot to mention that we are also good friends. Uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be uh, here. Uh, um, I'm not late, yeah? Just, we're, we're, we're right on time. Uh, I was looking forward to this. Um, I hear that all of you are graduate students. Am I correct? Yes. That's exciting. Some of you perhaps PhD candidates. Good. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to just have an interactive session with you. Uh, why don't we start with Trump's speech yesterday at the UN and try to put that in perspective. So I'm going to use two perspectives here to make sense of uh, things and be faithful to your theme of global development. One perspective is going to be realism. Alan Hans Morgenthau, who was my teacher and who influenced me quite a bit, and he's the father of realism. So we are going to put what Trump said yesterday in the context of realism, and then we are going to look at the larger backdrop of globalization. And, uh, and uh, using that framework uh, to make sense of, uh, you know, the election of Trump to presidency and, and what is happening in our country and what is happening also globally in terms of rise of uh, uh, populism or authoritarianism and, 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 and what are all of what are the implications of all of this for development, economic and political development uh, of advanced countries and also developing countries? Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Right? Uh, all of you listened to Trump uh, at the UN yesterday or, you know, read? Yeah. Uh, so, um, the themes that I picked up, I didn't, I was working uh, all day yesterday, so I didn't hear him live, but uh, you know, look at the transcript uh, uh, of his speech. So he uh, proceeded again, America first vision. OK, 
Carter, he asserted American sovereignty, sovereign independence, and this is not, neither one of these are new. This assertion of American sovereignty, he did that with his budget, federal budget. It was really asserting American, you know, America first, American sovereignty. He did that with climate change by rejecting that, you know, we are not going to entangle ourselves with this. Connected to this America first vision is also Trump's nationalism kind of native nationalism that I'll explain, which has a base, a developing base in America. And, and he essentially has refuted the leader, leadership and responsibility and all the architecture that has been built since World War II in terms of global institutions, uh, UN, World Bank, uh, got before no World Trade Organization, all of that, he, he just he doesn't have much respect for the kind of visionary leadership shown by wise men that established all of that uh, for uh, Europe to recover from World War II and for America to establish its preeminence, the hegemon in chief for many, many years in shaping the, you know, the global governance that, uh, that we have had till he got elected. Also in the speech, he asserted American hard power, military power. He said that, uh, uh, if I am correct, he said that we are spending the largest amount of money 700, and, and we are going to be the strongest ever military. Hard power. So, let's put it in perspective. And two more things. He um, essentially told uh, Korea that we can do total destruction on you. 25 million or more of your people, we can come, you know, if you continue on this suicide mission. And he also called uh, Iran, my native country, uh, what did he call it, Iran, uh, despicable nation, uh, he, uh, he used I, it. I believe he called it a, uh, a, a, a corrupt system, authoritarian a corrupt system, system. he used another, of democracy. yeah, <laughs> and, and essentially, and that's, that's the most worrisome thing for us. Come October, the certification to Congress that Iran is complying with the nuclear deal has to happen again. He certified it, you know, uh, earlier this year, and, and all indications are he's not going to certify them. And uh, and uh, and that sets the stage. I actually got uh, an alert uh, coming from National American national Iranian American consul that uh, uh, pretty much uh, is uh, that Trump is on a clear path to a start a disastrous war with Iran. Uh, take that seriously. Take it very seriously because uh, the best thing that he can do for his presidency, his troubled presidency, is to have a foreign war. And especially with a you know enemy like Iran that doesn't have many friends in Congress or in the US, going back to the hostage crisis. The minute it happens, you know, the congressmen, the senators would put flag in, uh, flags in their pocket and would clap him and you know, yeah, let's go and take revenge. And, and Iran is not going to be a cakewalk uh, like Iraq or Libya or Afghanistan. You're talking about a nation of almost 90 million with a lot of regional influence. Put it in perspective of realism. How many of you have studied realism or realist school? What is the guiding principle of realism? Uh, let's say, uh, Hans Morgenthau said the best foreign policy is what? Using power. Using power? 
using, uh, well, power is a central concept in realism, and the guiding post is following your national interests, rationally arrived at. The supreme virtue in realism is what? That, that, that's a manifestation of a struggle for power. Morgenthau's classic is politics among nations, the struggle for power and peace. It's a given. You are going to have a struggle for power. It has been perpetual. It will continue. Uh, but the challenge is to achieve peace. When you read Morgenthau, he says a, a, a good foreign policy is a, what is the adjective I'm looking for? Is it, is it a foreign policy that does a good calculus of national interest, the benefits and risk. What is the term that he uses? The supreme virtue would be prudence. Prudence. Prudence is for you to put yourself in the shoes of your adversary and see the problem from their eyes and be prudent so you don't, uh, like Saddam Hussein was not prudent. He couldn't see, didn't study the intention of George W. Bush, the administration, that hey, you were really risking the survival of yourself and your nation. He was imprudent, he was an irrational actor. Realism, international politics makes sense when you have rational actors, okay? Uh, so, you have him coming to the UN yesterday and says, well, you give up your nuclear weapons, otherwise you are going uh, to risk annihilation. And then at the same time he's telling Iran, you are going to tear up the agreement that was achieved multilaterally, not with the US. There were, the UN was involved and you know, five plus uh, uh, you know, other countries were involved. So North Korea says, excuse me, so you want to make an agreement so I give up my nuclear weapons, and then if Iran is the president, you are going to tear that up and perhaps have a confrontation and do a regime ch change. Hell no, I'm going to keep the weapons I have as deterrence against your invasion. What North Korea is looking for is deterrence because they are afraid that the US will come in and do a regime change. The same with Elon. What Elon was essentially asking for is an agreement that you won't have any kind of regime change like how it happened in, in Europe. That is the main reason why they want to have nuclear weapon. This way they can survive. According to realism, this is rational. It is an anarchia system, the international system that we have. It is a self-help system. Every nation pursues its national interest. And the defense of your country is the paramount national interest. So if you were put in the place of Rohan in Iran, you say, hell, you know, either the agreement holds or I'm restarting my nuclear program. The same with the dictator of North Korea. I mean, you may disagree with the character of the regime, um, whatever, but the, that's the basic fact of uh, international politics. Deterrence works. Uh, so, putting it in larger context, uh, Morgenthau would say military power is important. But you have to be careful that that is not the only thing that you have. Because if, you, if this is the only thing you rely upon, then you are going to have backlash. Other nations would gang up against you. Uh, so when I was doing my dissertation, uh, which was on Gorbachev, and uh, I was using Morgenthau a lot, this is what he said in 1969. The real power of a nation consists not in the number of nuclear warheads it holds or the number of divisions or aircraft carriers, but of moral image it presents, not only in words, but more particularly in deeds to the rest of the world. 
that moral image is invaluable. You had that during the Obama administration. So when Obama comes in after George W. Bush, you know, American perce perception of America abroad, many, in many countries, 70, 80, 90% was negative. Obama comes, it reverses itself, except for a few countries, perhaps Israel, Russia, or uh, India. Uh, the rest of the countries, all 80, 90% becomes positive image of America. Because Obama talked about multilateralism, engaging the UN, soft power, smart power. That yes, we have our military power, but we are also going to extend our hand to Iran. We are going to admit the mistakes we have made in the past in terms of overthrowing a democratic government in Iran. Uh, and we don't see Muslims as enemies, not as other, but you know, people that we can engage and build bridges with. So the image change. Now, if you look at Pew surveys that are done, uh, and you should really take a look at it, PEW, uh, you know, uh, they, they do surveys all the time. You see this totally dark and negative perception of America. So. Reliance on military power, I've got seven billion dollars I'm spending. This is not a sign of strength. This is, this is what you call it. I don't know, showmanship. Uh, it is not realism because in the final analysis, it is going to threaten other nations, either the form alliances, which is very likely to happen between Russia and China, or, or you know, or some other countries. So, but that is imprudent use of your power. So, that is, you know, pretty much putting, uh, you know, my take on Trump in the context of realism. Any questions here? I want to know if you agree, disagree, or you have any other insights. Thank you, Professor. I have a very simple question. Is Trump irrational? I think so. Thank you. I think so. Um, you know, and I, I pause a little bit. <coughs> Because uh, traditions matter, institutions matter, and uh, he is demolishing them. He is absolutely demolishing them. Uh, he is not respecting the Congress, he's not respecting the courts, he's not respecting the institutions that were built by US. You know, over decades, he's demolishing them. So, in terms of uh, you know, when you study foreign policy, American foreign policy, or even international politics, you see patterns, there's continuity, more continuity than change. What you are seeing now, what you saw in the UN yesterday, the New York, New York Times called it in its editorial, a huge deviation from any statesman coming on topic, a place of peace that people get together to uh, resolve, conflict peacefully by compromise, by diplomacy, he comes and talks about war. And total destruction, that's irrational. This is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you really look at American national interest, he is not serving it. And if you go to war with uh, uh, Korea, North Korea, that's going to be nuclear war. So you have 25 million people. If you go to war with Iran, Iran has allies in Lebanon, in Syria, in, in other areas. It's going to be a total reg regional war. What national interests are you serving here? It's imprudent. It is dangerous. It is destructive. And in the final analysis, it will lead to more terrorism, global terrorism. So it is irrational. In that sense, it is irrational. It's an interesting question that you ask. Uh, Hans Morgenthal, uh, when he was uh, studying Vietnam War, which was in the you know, 60s, late 60s, he wrote that uh, international politics 
it's a rational theory of international politics. He says with regard to Vietnam War, we also have to develop an irrational theory of international politics because how Johnson was acting, how Nixon was acting, was irrational and detrimental to American interests. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I, I, don't, I wanted to make the question very simple because uh, I tried to look at the continuum of uh, realism and idealism, prudence, soft power, but I, I think uh, times are emerging because uh, the product of Trump's presidency is still dynamic. Nobody knows how it's going. So it's really very, very difficult to begin to, uh, to, to qualify what the end will be at this point because period to his campaign he came with some form of nationalism but the product level so i just decided to make it a simple question because if you look side by side saddam hussein uh muammar gaddafi or the young man uh, kim jong-un in north korea uh possibly or even the characteristics mr trump is exhibiting their uh some some similarities in provocative uh, bravado kind of uh, uh, behavior that you may not really uh, relate to maybe like President Obama. So is Trump irrational? Simple as that. So that's why I just made the question because there are a lot of things to talk about, but maybe it's early until something disastrous happens before we actually come up with specifics to say America is stuck with this guy, this guy might not be good for America. I rest my question. Let's take the globalization perspective to see if I can answer your question more deeply. Okay. So, uh, globalization. Uh, you know, I want to urge you, the earliest book on globalization that was written before Thomas Friedman wrote his book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, Understanding Globalization. The earliest one was this book by William Grider, who was at that time the, a, a correspondent for Rolling Stones magazine. Now he is the national correspondent for The Nation magazine. And uh, this was 1997. Uh, Friedman wrote his book in 1999-2000, and he doesn't give any credits to William Grider. But I believe that he grasped the, the uh, significance of this latest phase of globalization better than anybody else by even comparing it to industrial revolution in its consequences. So he says that, so the, the name of the book is One World Ready or Not. And, uh, and he says that what you are seeing in globalization in its latest phase, that we really are, trace this latest phase to uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. So it is late 1970s, early 1980s that this new phase of globalization began and it takes off with vengeance after Clinton becomes president and the Cold War ends in 1990, 1991. Um, he says that this is how he describes um, um, globalization, driven driven by the logic of modern global capitalism and revolutionary technologies, globalization is a wondrous, freewheeling process that is reordering the world as it, as it transforms the lives and economic prospects of workers, corporations, and nations. The dynamics of the emergent global economy is producing multiplicity of opportunities and dangers for diverse peoples and nations, rich and poor alike. 
the essence of what is now forming is an economic system of interdependence. Underline that. Interdependence designed to ignore the prerogatives of nations, even the most powerful ones. People are trying to cope with this, with the great social transformations visible across many societies. He likens it to industrial revolutions. He says it is war historical, um, but the essence of it is that borders are disappearing and we are becoming one world. And the essence of this is interdependence. America led the process of globalization, you know, and, uh, and, and, and what we have now today is deep interdependence, economically and many other aspects. You can't come, Trump cannot come and say, well, uh, you know, uh, I am sovereign, independent. It's, you know, rolling out. It's reshaping the world economy. You are integrally connected with it. If you want to disown it, then you're not importing these cheap products from China, then your level of uh, living is, becomes much more expensive for the textiles you purchase, for a lot of things. We have benefited from the process of globalization handsomely. So if you come and uh, arrest it, undo it, it is going to affect us so adversely. There will be trade wars, economic wars, uh, political wars, you know, uh, new alliances form. That is what he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that globalization is a fact. You can't reverse it. You can regulate it to make it more sustainable, to make it uh, more just, uh, more democratic. And I'll tell you why it is not democratic, because it is benefiting less than 1% of the world population very much. Uh, but globalization is here to stay. He doesn't understand that. Give you another example. Uh, radical uh, Islamic uh, terrorism. He mentioned again in his, you know. And when he mentions it, he doesn't have new ones. Because Muslims, you know, hearing that, or American folks hearing that, they think that all Islam is radical. How many Muslims do you have in the world today? Oh, Followers of Muslim? 1.8 billion. 1.8, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8. Many of them are Muslims. Many of these Muslims are consumers of globalization. Correct. They trade with you, they buy from America, they sell oil to America. You are going to wall off 1.8 billion people from globalization. You're going to eliminate them? Knowing, knowing well that of, out of 1.8 billion, 0.001% are radical, are terrorists, are jihadists, are, are violent. You're going to dismiss more than 99% of the Muslims and say they are your enemies? Okay, that's self-fulfilling prophecy. Have it. Have them as your enemies. That, these are the irrational things. This is why Obama went to Cairo and is in the speech. He says, Muslims are our brothers, our sisters. We want, we want to engage with you and we want your help to, you know, to check on the radicals. But to come and, and, and then manifestations of it in executive order and in the kind of uh, uh, bias attacks that we have seen against Muslims, this is not leadership. Especially when you look at Muslims in America, the most integrated, prosperous, pretty much accepting the framework of America, very diverse Muslims coming from all over. You are going to eliminate these people that could be your allies. This is misguided policy. This is what you know uh, that uh, that concerns me most. That you are going to get the result. You know, the negative result that is not there 
what you're, you know, you're, you're pushing for. So let's go um, um, back to uh, uh, global. So is globalization all bad? What is the most magnificent part of globalization that you may not have heard, and I want to, you know, bring to your attention so you're aware of it? What is something that globalization in its latest phase has shown to us that uh, has demolished some perception? What, what would it be? So globalization essentially, uh, uh, both uh, Greider and Friedman say that you know, after war, uh, Cold War ended, it has reached every corner of the world. Vietnam, Haiti, China, every corner. They're, they're connected. It's this deep integration. Uh, and uh, but what has it done in its latest phase? I just want you to go back to imperialism and colonialism. And what were the perceptions? of the South during that time. That could be positive or negative. So he, when he says one world, ready or not, he actually Greider talks about a kind of global conver a convergence. He doesn't talk about a mono civilization, but he says that you know, whether you like it or not, you are part of that uh, that one world, and, uh, and and you are seeing you know, uh, you have heard that you know wherever you go, you see this. Uh, Western styles, malls, Western style food, and all of these things. Um, but what he's talking about one world is not so much malls and food. It is that the consciousness that you have no longer is national. Problems are global. Disease is global. Trade is global. You know, uh, everything is global now. And uh, that, is, that is what he's saying. And I want you to make a note here that even national interests now, you can't be defined in terms of your own territory, of your own nation. When you look at the threat of nuclear weapons, that's global. Even if you invade uh, Korea, North Korea, and use a nuclear warhead, or you hit their nuclear warheads, you could actually cause damage to Japan, to China, to other countries. We know, you know, that if you have 10 nuclear warheads pretty much going off anywhere in the world, you could destroy civilization. That's global. That's a threat that is global. Uh, so what I was referring to, and this is little notice, is during coloni uh, colonialis colonialization and imperialism, the people are thought People of South were seen as inferior. They had to be civilized. They, 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 they could only do elementary work, uh, uh, produce raw materials or agriculture. They couldn't do sophisticated things, right? That was the perception. That we do the manufacturing, high skill things, they do the, the lowest skill, you know. Wasn't that the perception that we had? People in the south. In the south, yeah. So you know, uh, that globalization in this latest phase has demolished that. Let me read for you, and just bear with me, even with my accent, to see what Ryder is saying as he travels around the world. And remember, this was written in 1997, so that is what 20 years later. 20 years. Uh, so. Uh, this is, he says, the most powerful moments, however, as he's, as he's traveling, were the recurring experience of witnessing poor people who dwell in marginal backwaters doing industrial work of the most advanced order. People of color, people who are black, yellow, red, brown, 
who exist in surroundings of primitive scarcity are making complex things of world, of world class quality, mastering modern technologies that used to be confined to a select few. The tools of advanced civilizations are being shared with other tribes. Multinational corporations, awesomely powerful and imperiously aloof, are the, are the ironic vehicle for accomplishing this generous act of history. Those people in Vietnam, in the very poor areas in, uh, in other parts of the world, are doing the most sophisticated. Take your iPhone, look at it. Just see how, where it is produced. You see that it's essentially produced in, in developing countries. Uh, not maybe one, but more than uh, 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 um, one. And it goes on. The confident presumption that certain high caliber work can be done only by certain people, mainly it is assumed by well-educated white people in a few chosen countries, is mistaken. And this book visits a few of the many places where the workers daily prove it wrong. Observing these scenes of industrial activity, I thought first of the explosive implications for the future of work and prosperity in the advanced economies, including America. That gives you an explanation of what is happening, happening with white <coughs> workers here who are so anxious and want to wall off the rest of the world because they feel that jobs are going to be lost. Before, it was low level, many of jobs. Now, any job can be exported. So he is telling you, 20 years later, look at the explosive implications of what is happening even in advanced countries like America. The portents are stark and threatening, the implications. Yet the meaning also has to be understood in a broader sweep of human history. Watching former peasants making high-tech goods for the global market, I eventually reached a simpler, more nourishing understanding. Of course I thought, people are capable everywhere in the world. So that is the realization that globalization is producing, that it does away with all those racial inferiority, superiority, color lines, all of that. People anywhere are capable of doing that. And you're in a highly interdependent world. You have to accept that some of the jobs here are going to be exported because they're more economical to be done in other countries. So the challenge then here is, how do you uh, 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 prepare your nation, your workforce, your people to compete in a highly interdependent global economy? Is Trump doing that? Hell no, he's not doing that. He's not even understanding that. Obama understood that. That's why he was investing in community colleges, in worker retraining, in, in investments, uh, uh, you know, so the companies can come back here to make America more competitive. You know, essentially, you look at this administration, uh, you know, he talks the populist language, but w the policies are all for the rich. The people he has in, in his government are all rich. This is why the worst case scenario could still come. Uh, uh, and if you push this too far, and you have a trade war with China, then the process of globalization can be interrupted, and it could have severe implications. I'll stop here, and then you ask more questions, and I'll give you more. Um, okay, so I have several. I just hope that I can remember all of them. Um, so when we talk about William Greidner, uh, he th and the fact that he is an American economic, economics uh, professor, or whatever. He's a political journalist, but with deep power. Do you, you, do know. you think that had he been an immigrant, this wouldn't have been taken as seriously? The fact that he is American and has made all those 
you know, um, I mean, observations in the world from an economical perspective as an American. Good point, very good point. A white person going all over the world and making this observation, yeah, he's taken as much more credibility. Right. I mean, you also have another observer, uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, Natalia shared with you, pra uh, Prakhana. Uh, any of you have read his books? He writes on globalization. Uh, he wrote about the emergence of the second world. Uh, uh, he's based now in Singapore, but he was with America, uh, New America Foundation. He has written about the same thing, but not with as much, mm -hmm. you know, or Thomas Friedman. You know, uh, he, oh my God, his book became the queen, you know. But let me even tell you about uh, Thomas Friedman. You know, so in uh, in uh, 1999, he wrote uh, a, 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 an article called a Manifesto for the Fast War. A Manifesto for the Fast War. That's 1999. This is the article that the book, the Lexus and Olive Three, was based on. Does anyone understand why he calls it the Lexus and Olive Three? Do you, what, what does re Lexus represent? Lexus is the car? Luxury. Ultra modern? Luxury? Mm -hmm. Luxury. Lexus represents the forces of integration, of globalization integration. And what does olive tree represent? Roots, traditions, my culture. So. He essentially says that what you're witnessing in globalization is this incredible uh, forces of integration, but at the same time, nations and culture positioning themselves in reaction to that. Uh, and these, these are olive trees. And, and uh, essentially, a, a kind of uh, equilibrium, a kind of balance position in your country that you keep your heritage but take advantage of globalization. That is the challenge. That's what he's talking about. So in his book, uh, every great book that you read uh, from the beginning to the end, if you really read it carefully and read it totally and they are masterworks, they are going to have a contradiction. The author the author um, evolves. So uh, who was it that talked about idealism? You mentioned it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Hans J. Morgenthau, his classic Politics Among Nations. How many of you have read that? All of it? Uh, I'm going to send my review of that book to Natalie that uh, um, I reviewed, he was my professor at New School for Social Research when I started graduate school and he passed away, you know, a couple of years later. I only had one course with him, but he influenced me tremendously. So when you look at Hans Morgenthau, in the beginning he's very factual. Um, the uh, international politics is, is uh, it's selfish, people, uh, uh, nations pursue their national interests and out of all these uh, you know, national interest, a balance of power emerges that can be disturbed by forces of imperialism, and, you know, and, 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 and all of that. So, uh, the, you know, what you mentioned, the essential concept is power, the struggle for power is perpetual, accept that, and given that, use diplomacy and other means to mitigate, mitigate com uh, conflict and to build a foundation you know, a global foundation, a world foundation uh, for, uh, you know, for peace. So he's writing his book at a time that the threat of nuclear war is uh, big. You know, uh, you know, at one point before the end of Cold War, uh, America had, in terms of all mixes of intermediate, uh, a tactical and intercontinental, more than 80,000 nuclear warheads. 
Uh, so he looks at it, he says, this, this is crazy. This, it cannot, you are going to destroy civilization. Morgan thought that way. George F. Cannon, the other greatest state, statements thought that way. Uh, so he essentially is saying towards the end of the work, he becomes a little bit idealist. He says that we really have to give up some of our sovereignty, especially in this area, to a supranational organization, especially the, uh, this uh, knowledge or you know this, this nuclear uh, 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 weapons knowledge. He, the man becomes almost an idealist towards the end, not believing in physical force, but in really establishing a world community for permanent peace. The same with um, uh, Thomas Friedman. In the beginning, when you, oh, he's an enthusiast for globalization, he talks about golden straight jacket that every nation has to wear, which is a set of policies to plug, plug into the game of globalization so you don't burn, and all of that, and he loves the electronic herd. These are the people that control capital money that they can, you know, go and invest it anywhere or speculate, you know, against currencies. And then he gets to chapter 14. Okay. Uh, so in chapter 14, he says, I am, I am an extreme integrationist social safety nether. So when you're integrationist, that means you're really for the game of globalization and you think you should proceed. And, and he's very much an enthusiast for it. But he says at the same time, you have to have a social safety net because what globalization is doing, the set of policies that we have, it, uh, it shreds those social safety net. There are people that cannot survive in the game of globalization. They become have-nots. He calls them turtles, and they have to be taken care of. I believe you dare not be a globalizer without being a safety netter and social democrat. Because if you don't equip the have-nots, no-nots, and turtles to survive in the new system, they will eventually produce a backlash that will choke off your country from the world. And I believe you dare not be a safety letter or social democrat without being a globalizer, because without ever increasing integration, you will never generate the incomes and absorb the technologies needed to keep the standards of living rising. It's beautifully put. The balance. What has happened in our nation is, because we are this kind of laissez-faire, pure capitalist nation, you know, we have gotten into this game of globalization. We are not like Germany or we are not like Switzerland. And we haven't provided that social safety net for our citizens. We can even decide on health care for everybody in this country. In the game of globalization that the worker has to be mobile and go from one job to another and have a portable health. This way, they, do, they are not afraid if they change jobs, they are going to lose their health, uh, health insurance. We can't even decide on any this elemental benefit for our people. So, and, and these are, you know, and, and forget about infrastructure, forget about the lousy education that we have at the, you know, at the public um, school system. And, uh, you know, we, you know, here, you wonder how the hell Trump got elected. Well, you had some workers there that for generations were in one factory and, 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 and they were making very good, you know, living. Suddenly those factories are gone. The cities, the towns are ghost towns. They haven't retooled themselves and, 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 and their work. But where did my jobs go? Where did my level of life go? That, it's not only white working class, but also middle class. 
even upper middle class, those people also voted for Trump. They are unsure. They are unsure what is happening here. They have lost their jobs. So rather than having enlightened leadership coming and saying, we are this, in this context of globalization, we really have to ready ourselves for this game of globalization. That means, you know, we are going to invest in, you know, in, in our community colleges, in workforce development, in infrastructure, in having companies come and invest here. We haven't done, uh, Obama began doing that. So we are a nation in trouble that we don't have a leadership that is preparing our citizens. I'll stop again here to see if you have any questions. Uh, I saw your hand before, yeah. go ahead. C compared to economic and other globalization, why are not the people's idea glo globalized? Because uh, as uh, globalized uh, get deep, but people's idea seems more Ex exclusive. So why I, that? I, I love your question. Uh, why don't we just take America as an example? So when you look at the graph here, this is the diversity explosion. So essentially, it is telling you by the year 2040, 45, the whites are going to become a minority in America. That's the diversity explosion. This is a fact. Uh, and we know from all research that immigrants, when they come here, they are engine of growth, creativity, that we benefit from that. That diversity, that diversity is good. It is our strength. Because there isn't a, a, a correct understanding of globalization, in our country now, the white people are saying, arrest immigration, reverse it, don't let most Muslims in, don't let immigra immigrants in, and then you see this white supremacy marches and all of that, and uh, it is not a global mindset. It is a nativist. It is a backlash, because they're not understanding that it is not the immigrants, you know, that are coming and taking jobs. They may take some job, but they generate more jobs. Even DACA students, the dreamers, the 800,000, uh, 1 million. The research that was done, if you, act, if you deport all of them, the cost is $7.5 billion for businesses because they have already trained them. They have jobs, they're managers, they're working, you know, and then you have to hire new ones and train them. There's an economic cost. So to keep them where they are and give them citizenship or permanent residency is better for America because it's going to be economic dislocation. And uh, you know, uh, so that mindset of globalization. You know, Grider um, in his book, uh, it's fascinating. I really would like you uh, to uh, take a look at it. You probably can get it on Amazon.com for one buck now because it is 1997. He says in the age of globalization, the mindset that you have to, uh, has to be also global. You, you have to expand your, global, your consciousness so it is global. Even if you're buying things, you have to really know, was this made by slave labor, by sweatshops, you have a social responsibility to know what were the conditions that you also have a responsibility to have empathy for people, the 3.5 billion people in the world that, makes, that make less than $2 a day, 1 billion that make less than $1 a day, and say, wait a minute, what is the kind of world that we are living that is producing such inequality. Um, in the research that I did, uh, a book that I'm going to mention to you, and that is by uh, Krista, Krista Freeland, who was an MP in Canada. No, she's foreign minister of Canada, by the way. Her book is uh, Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global Super Rich and the Fall of Everyone Else. I'll give this to Natalie so you know she can provide you the references. And this is what she's saying. This is the inequality of globalization. 
the 20th century, no, let me go one sentence higher. As the plutocrats have been getting richer and more powerful, we have taxed and regulated them less. And the rules of the game, again, like the first Gilded Age, favor those who are winning it. The 20th century was the century of inclusion because the business elite, particularly the Americans, understood that they could prosper only if the middle class prospered too. Therefore, there was an implicit social contract during the Cold War. For the plutocrats, this is the super rich, for the plutocrats, globalization has reduced this incentive because they can now sell to anywhere. Moreover, she says, as the economic gap between the plutocrats and everyone else becomes a chasm, they are coming to inhabit their own global gated community. The same global forces that are enriching and empowering the 1% super rich have put Western workers in direct competition with low paid workers in developing countries and have had a punishing impact on the middle class. The global forces have a profound impact on American people and this is the result of that in the, in the last election. You know, this is my friend, I, I read for you a 1997 book. This is not new. We knew the analysis of what globalization can produce even as early as 1996. I was teaching at Vassar College, a summer program at Vassar College at that time. This is the, the Cold War has ended, and this is in foreign affairs, the preeminent foreign international affairs foreign policy journal. Very quickly, uh, the, this guy, Ethan uh, Capstein, who was the director of uh, studies of, at Council on Foreign Relations, the article is Workers and the World Economy Breaking the Post-War Bargain. Christoph Freeland just talked about the social contract. He's referring to, do, uh, to it as well. He says the global economy is leaving millions of disaffected workers in its train. Inequality, unemployment, and endemic poverty have become its handmaidens. Rapid technological change and heightening international competition are fraying the job markets of the major industrialized countries. At the same time, systemic pressures are curtailing every government's ability to respond with new spending. Just when working people most need the nation state as a buffer from the world economy, or you can say the forces of globalization, the nation state is abandoning them. Unbelievable. When you had the Cold War and the threat of communism, America, the, you know, the corporate elite were saying, oh, let's provide a social contract. Let's give them you know, stability and security of jobs because we don't want them to uh, be attracted to communism. The minute this Cold War is finished, the social bargain is gone, the social contract is gone. This is in the establishment journal. In 1996, he's saying, this is, this is his conclusion. This is an age of widespread economic insecurity brought about by profound changes in trade, finance, and technology. Like the German elite in the Weimar, Weimar? Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, they dismiss, our elite dismiss mounting workers' dis dissatisfaction. And this is the final sentence. Now he's likening the situation that we may get, like you had the situation before Nazism emerged in Germany. Leaders need to recognize the policy failures and respond accordingly. If they do not, there are others 
waiting in the wings who will, perhaps on less pleasant terms, Trump is one of them. He came, he responded to the dissatisfaction of those workers, those who are anxious, and you got his presidency. This analysis was there from 1996. We knew about that. We knew a report from the UN Development Program, Globalization with a Human Face, that said you have a globalization process, but you don't have the architecture to regulate it, and it's going to enrich very few, and the rest are going to be dissatisfied. So all of that research was there, but the policy elite, the policy makers did not pay attention. And you got one crisis after another, the latest being in 2008, that almost devastated us. Now, at the time that you need enlightened leaders to tackle the problems of globalization, you get Trump here. Yes. But how long do you think that the most important to Trump would take them to to accept the fact that he is not the right person, that he's not doing what they were expected? That's a very good question. I give the it will take them so long they might want them the second time I give me. You know, you may not like my answer, uh there's an emotional connection to Trump. These are people, essentially white, that uh, they are anxious about the diversity that they are saying, seeing that they are going to become minority. They have the economic anxiety. They have the white privilege. Trump's failure is their failure. And their racial prejudices too, we know that. We saw that from Charlottesville you know, you will not displace us, and you know, it's anti-Jewish, anti-black, anti-Muslim. There's an emotional connection here. They can't accept failure. Trump is like the last prophet for them. And I don't know what it would take for them to realize that uh, the emperor doesn't have any clothes, that this is not. I don't know, I really don't. It's depressing. Because I, because every every poll that is taken, his base that forty percent that minority hasn't eroded, they're still for him. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, oh, he has a question. Okay. Sorry, sorry. So I understand that uh, regarding Trump and the rise of nationalism in the U.S. Uh, that because immigrants came to this country or to this world just because the leadership here. Four decades opened up, you know, the, the, the spread of ideas of democracy and all of those things. People came for jobs, for good life, and everything. But don't you think, I'm from Pakistan, the backlash in some ways in the U.S., like people are not immigrant friendly, is because the East or the Muslim world is not opening up either. I mean, we have seen like our countries are not opening up. Forget about the Americans or the Europeans. Maybe they don't want to come because they're okay here. But we are not opening up to our neighbors. I and mean, look at Saudi Arabia. Look at within Pakistan, one province is not accepting the refugees from the north. So, and I mean, two wrongs do not make a right. So it's like if we are not opening up. They shouldn't open up. But there is that responsibility also on. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. As a human rights activist, I would agree with you totally. I'm the most critical person of my own native country of Iran. Uh, Iran's involvement with uh, uh, Syria, the butcher, uh, Bashar al Assad, you know, knowing, you know, you know from various amnesty reports the kind of war crimes he has committed. And, uh, uh, and even a reformist president, an elected president, not being able to shake that policy. My hope was nuclear deal would essentially engage US and Iran and they would find a solution in Syria. But you are absolutely right, there's bad behavior there too. I and mean, Jesus, in Pakistan, you, you got 
the Pakistani, um, what is that, ISA, pretty much uh, uh, taking care of Osama bin Laden next door to them, next to that, uh, I, I mean, the mess that they are creating in Afghanistan and supporting the, uh, you know, Taliban and Mujahideens and all of that. They, 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 we, we do have our faults. We do have even among, in our nations in Pakistan, let's say in Afghanistan, in other areas, the Sunni Shia um, uh, conflict state intolerance. Saudi Arabia is the most, the, it's the ugliest form. And then tourism. Uh, in his view and his speech, I'll come to you in a second answer. And, and, and he said, you, you must be kidding me. You know, here you have Wahhabism that has been pretty much nurturing terrorists all over the world and financing them. And, uh, uh, and you are praising them and you are calling Iran this, you know, uh, you know whatever. Um, uh, so, yes, you do, you do have fun. But I, I, I also want to advise you, when you look at 1.8 billion Muslims globally in so many nations, they're highly diverse. You have democratic Muslim countries, and you have repressive, despotic ones like um, Saudi Arabia. And you have to be very, very careful uh, not to brush them all as radical or repressive. Um, Reza Aslan, in his book, um, No God But God, uh, talks about a needed reformation within Islam, that we need to really uh, reconcile Islam to modernity, to democracy. Uh, he sees that reformation happening, and he feels that the reforma that reformation <coughs> is impeded when you have these frequent interventions, like American inter intervention, in Iraq to make a model of democracy for for the rest to follow. And I don't think that reformation has occurred. That, that is needed for us to fully join the game of globalization and become fully democratic. Uh, you know, so I agree with you. I think we have joined maybe economically or in other ways, but when it comes to ideas, I don't think I understand, you know, you made a very good point that um, keeping that balance, you know, you want to keep cultural heritage, but at the same time, you also want to open up to, to the world of ideas, to accept, you know, diversity and thoughts in your culture, yeah, but that's not yeah, really it's happening. also It's also a complex picture, I'm sure Natalie can tell you about it. Uh, as well, because she was involved with the human rights movement. You look, for example, even at Saudi Arabia. You, know, you have forces of liber liberalization uh, there in Saudi Arabia. Who's the young blogger that's in, in jail? Uh, Frank Bawali. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, here, you have him, you have a, you have, uh, a number of others, even in that despotic system, saying, you know, we need freedom, we need liberalism. Look at Iran, my God. You have the most connected country in terms of internet, uh, you know. You have one, a nation with uh, more than 60% of, of population less than 30 years old, highly educated, aspiring to join the world, and then you have got a repressive government in the, un in the unelected part, not Rohani, he's a reformist, I know, you know, about his writing and everything. Uh, you know, so you have a chokehold by this unelected sector and revolutionary God that supports it. But if that is gone, oof, a vibrant civil society, and you see a flourishing of Iran. You, know, you know, most, if you look at the entrepreneurs in America, uh, look at who took over Uber now. Uber is an Iranian uh, that took over Uber. You look at eBay, that's an Iranian that, uh, you look at, what was that, uh, uh, Julia, where is Julia? Who was the, uh, the guy that took over Uber? He, he had a travel site. What was that uh, that he, he created? Uh, it's a famous that Expedia? you can, yes. Expedia. Expedia, he created, I mean, you have got all these brains that have escaped Pakistan, Iran, 
And they're here. They're innovating. They're creating jobs. They're making our lives more calm. Can you imagine if they went back and they were, as it is happening in India? Anybody from India here? Yeah, you see some, you know, wonderful brains that are going back to India and developing India. Uh, so yeah, we have, you have an excellent question. Uh, it's not only a challenge here nationally dealing with Trump, but also dealing with our own uh, zealots and, uh, and reactionaries. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, we have time for one more question. And I saw Manasa has her hand up. Um, okay. but, uh, so I just wanted to add to what Aslam just said while I was thinking along the same line. I wanted to know what you thought about a much smaller phenomenon, perhaps, of so immigrants are received differently in America and Europe, for example. America, in by theory, is the land of immigrants. So you're at least theoretically more open to them and more open to the diversity. It's a natural outcome. Whereas in Europe, it's more of a, a, a benefactor system in a way, more or less. But what I was thinking about was within the immigrant communities in these first worlds, there is a sense of trying to recreate where you came from as opposed to going with the flow. So you have very tight-knit, um, I don't know if ghettoized is the, is the word to use, but communities trying to stay in that time and place where they came from. At least I notice this in a lot of Hindu immigrant communities where a lot of, and they're all economically often do well, and a lot, a lot of it is also used to fund fundamental organizations in India or in Pakistan or in the home country, let's say. So what is the balance between your allegiance or your memories to your, of your home country, of your cultures and whatever, and to adapt in a new country? How do you... Um, it's, it's a good question, and that's the last question you're asking. Um, I want to give you another piece of my research in response to that. I thought you were going somewhere, uh, but you're not. But so I'll answer that, but uh, give you some historical context on, on the American nation. You know, immigrant groups vary. Some of them come here and uh, and, uh, and and totally can mesh, and, uh, and they can maintain their uh, their heritage, perhaps privately, but in public they are, you know, uh, very much uh, part of this melting pot. And. Uh, and some others are much more guarding of their heritage and the way they dress and all of that. And we accept that in America. As long as there is a larger framework and larger common ground that we can walk on, right? Um, now, I want to connect you to this research you know, that, I, that I have. America is different from Europe. In America, from the founding of America, going back to Thomas Jefferson, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating when you go and uh, because when you listen to Trump, you want to bring some of this research in his face. The grain of America is that from the beginning, uh, the founding fathers knew this would become an immigrant land. So they established a framework of inclusive citizenship and religious pluralism. So the book uh, by uh, Dennis Spalberg, Thomas Jefferson's Goran. Uh, in that book, she says that in, in, you know when they were trying to write the Declaration of Independence. At that time, you have the Jews and the Catholics that are despised. And pretty much the majority wanted to establish a Christian nation here, a Protestant Christian nation. Thomas Jefferson reads Quran. A lot of Muslims were brought here as slaves. And it is Thomas Jefferson that establishes that framework. Uh, Muslims who were not even known to exist in the colonies, colonies became the imaginary outer limit for an unprecedented, uniquely American religious pluralism that would also encompass the actual despised, uh, despised minorities of Jews and Catholics. 
the rancorous public dispute concerning the inclusion of Muslims, for which principle Jefferson's political fo foes would vilify him to the end of his life, thus became decisive in the founder's <coughs> ultimate judgment not to establish a protestant nation as they might well have done. Jefferson uses imaginary Muslims in the future, even a possible Muslim president in the future, by saying we have to be inclusive. Therefore, we cannot establish a protestant nation. This is the wonderful framework that we have inherited from our founding fathers that Europe doesn't have. It is a framework of inclusion and religious pluralism. This is why immigrants can thrive here if they work within the framework, whereas in Europe, even if you work with, within the framework, you could still be marginalized and not fully empowered. Thank you so much, Dr. Pagari. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your good questions. Again, I want to thank you for coming in and taking the time to share your work and your insight with our students. This is extremely current. This is exactly what we should be doing in global affairs. And I want to thank you guys for really stepping up and asking such thoughtful and provocative questions. This is a, a wonderful discussion, and this is one, how we want to carry our colloquiums on uh, for the future. So thank you guys again. We will see you next week, and, and our speaker next week is Eddie Wright. Eddie Wright's from the UN FPA, United Nations Population Fund. So he'll be talking about how to launch a career uh, in the UN and also what the United Nations Population Fund does on the ground.